Hello to our friends joining us via recording. Today we are working on uh, our packet <clears throat> for lesson number 10, which is about the brain ventricles and the cranial nerves. Before we dived into brain ventricles and that kind of stuff, we worked together in a group to talk about a few of the particular uh, ideas from last week that bleed over to this week. One of the things that we talked about last week in the context of the brain is we talked about what are called the meninges, which are the connective tissue layers that we find surrounding the brain, keeping it safe. There are three meningeal layers that we see. When we talk about the meninges, help me out in the chat, all of them have the same last word in their name. What's the last word that all of my meninges have in their name? Yeah, so all of the meninges end with this word mater. Remember we talked about last week how mater means mother. Um, so think of a mother as a protective layer or a meningeal layer here. So we have three of them. The arachnoid mater, the dura mater, and the pia mater, three of our, our meningeal layers. When I'm talking about the meningeal layer that is attached directly to the brain, what's the, the first name, if you will, of the layer that's directly attached to the brain? Which layer is attached to the brain? Yeah, Ariel's voting, pia mater. Yep, a few more of us are chiming in. That is correct. The pia mater is the meningeal layer that's connected directly to the brain. Pia means merciful. Uh, this is the, the thinnest layer that we have attached of those meninges, and it's directly attached to the brain. Just above the pia mater, uh, what's the name of my next layer? The one here that I'm calling the middle layer. Yeah, that's the one that's a little bit harder to type, right? The, the middle layer is called the arachnoid mater, the arachnoid mater. This one gets its name because it kind of looks like spider webs. So you'll see some connective tissue that hangs down from it, some collagen fibers that hang down from it. That's what we call the arachnoid mater, which means that my, my last meningeal layer, the one that is the thickest and is also a directly attached to the skull, that layer is called the dura mater, the dura mater. So the dura mater is the outermost one. Now, dura mater looks a lot like this word right here, the dural venous sinus. The dural venous sinus is a place where the thick dura mater actually splits in half. What is found in between the two places or the two parts of the dural venous sinus? What's in here? Yeah, so, so the dural venous sinus was the place where I put oxygen-poor blood. So oxygen-poor blood that's circulated around the brain, and I'm sending it back to the, the bloodstream so that I can recycle it, give it more oxygen, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to send it in that dural venous sinus. So that's a, a space in between the two thick layers of the dura mater. We also have a space in, uh, in between the meninges that's filled with cerebrospinal fluid, which is a protective fluid that circulates around the brain. This space, the one that has CSF in it, cerebrospinal fluid, is my last option down here, the subarachnoid space. So make sure as we're studying this week, we know the difference between the dural venous sinus, where there's blood, and the subarachnoid space where I have cerebrospinal fluid. When we talk about cerebrospinal fluid, I not only find it in the subarachnoid space, I also find it in some structures that we're studying this week called ventricles. So ventricles are the fluid filled spaces inside the brain. They're filled with cerebrospinal fluid. We have four ventricles in the brain. So we have two of them that are called lateral ventricles, two lateral ventricles. Then since we have two of them, we start our numbering system with, with our next ventricle, which is called the third ventricle. 
And our final ventricle is called the fourth ventricle. Four ventricles in the brain, two that are called lateral, and we have the third and the fourth. The reason I had you identify these parts of, of the brain here is because these are the homes to each of the ventricles in the brain. When I talk about the cerebellum, can you steal that pencil up top? Let's label where the cerebellum is found. Where's the cerebellum found in the brain? Yeah, perfect. Getting a, getting a lot of circles here or lines here in this back section. This back section back here is the cerebellum. I like to remember the cerebellum as the little cerebrum. So it's got a lot of those same features. It's got the bumps called gyri, indentations called sulci. This is the cerebellum back here. Now the cerebellum frames in the fourth ventricle on the back side. The front side of the fourth ventricle is this thing right here. What's the name of this thing right here? Remember the name of this big bump? Yeah, so this big bump here is the pons. So the, the front of the brainstem, the pons, and the back, where I see the cerebellum, in between those, let me deal off one circle really fast. In between those, do you see this space right here? This space that I see right here is the fourth ventricle, or it's the fourth place in the brain where I have cerebrospinal fluid. So let me draw a little arrow over here. This is the space called the fourth ventricle. So between the cerebellum and the pons is the fourth ventricle. Yeah, so Nicole asked a good question. When we're looking at it on the model, is it the empty space? Yes, it is. Because this is a model, if we were in real life, if uh, this brain was alive inside a person, it wouldn't be an empty space. There would be cerebrospinal fluid inside of here. So since my model doesn't have cerebrospinal fluid, I just see an empty space right here. So this empty space between the cerebellum and the pons, this space is called the fourth ventricle. That's one of the places that I would find cerebrospinal fluid inside the brain. Now, if I go up, there's this area here. This is where I'm going to find the third ventricle. What did I tell you um, was the name of this part of the brain that kind of looks like a duck face? What was this part of the brain here in the very middle called? We labeled it. So it <laughs> sounds like a tricky question. I promise it's not. Yeah, so, so this space here in the middle duck face part of the brain this is the thalamus the thalamus let me so let me outline for you the thalamus in particular this part here in the middle is the thalamus region my little bill of the duck i'm going to add that on there as well this lower part here that's the bill of the duck was something called the hypothalamus this region inside here that makes the duck's face that's the area of the brain called the thalamus. In the very middle of the thalamus is where I find the third ventricle, so the third fluid-filled space. So if we looked inside this region here, this is going to be another open space that's filled with cerebrospinal fluid in the middle of the duck face of the brain, the thalamus of the brain. That's where I find the third ventricle. I have two lateral ventricles. These two lateral ventricles are found one in each of my cerebral hemispheres. Now this word cerebral hemispheres is just a fancy way of saying one half of the cerebrum or one half of the big part of the brain. So this particular image that I'm looking at of, of the brain this whole thing here, all the, this big part up here, is one cerebral hemisphere, or one half of the brain. My two lateral ventricles, there'd be one that'd be hiding inside here in this half of the brain, and in the other half of the brain, there would be another one hiding in, in the middle there. So two lateral ventricles, they're found inside the cerebral hemispheres. 
The third ventricle is found in the middle of the duct face, the area called the thalamus. And the fourth ventricle is found in between the cerebellum and the pons. It's the space in between them. So some brain structures to review for us to give us a reference uh, for where I find my, my parts of the cerebrospinal circulation or the places where I put fluid. One last activity that I, I had my groups do when we were, were thinking about the bones this week. This week we're working on everything from the shoulder down. We're working on movements of, of the arm and bone markings of the arm. We're starting with the humerus, going down into our forearm bones, down into to the fingers and the wrist bones. Hey, this morning, actually, my daughter asked me the name of the bones in here. When I'm pointing at the one on the thumb side, who lives on the thumb side? Who's over here on the thumb side? Yeah, so we're totally right. Thumb side, the one that's big down here at the bottom, that's the radius side. And over here on the other side is the ulna. So we've got the radius and the ulna. They articulate with the humerus to help us form the elbow joint. They articulate with the carpal bones to help us form the wrist. And then we've got all the little joints that are in between my finger bones. Hey, the name of my finger bones, what are those finger bones called? I know it's a long type, so I'll wait for a minute. Name of the finger bones. Perfect. Y'all type too fast. I barely got to drink my coffee there. <laughs> These are all the phalanges. So the little bones in your fingers, those are called the phalanges. We've got the bones that are found in the palm of your hand. These ones are called the metacarpals. And the little tiny bones in your wrist, those ones are called the carpals. Now, unfortunately, just like in the foot, how we had names for all of those tarsals, we've got names for all of these carpals as well. We'll make sure to take a little bit of class time today for us to talk about a mnemonic for helping us know the names of, of the carpal bones. But all of these have a name, the meta, uh, metacarpals and the phalanges. We're going to name them the same way that we named the ones in their foot. So those are really easy to memorize, at least. We don't have to know their particular names. Let's look at, at the joints that I ask you to find. These are, are the same joints you'll have to be able to find on the homework, and the same joints we'll have to be able to find on the exam. So, oh yeah, well, I was missing a T there, wasn't I? That's, that was a copy and paste error. Okay, the, the first one on our list here is the carpometacarpal joint. Carpometacarpal between two types of bones. Which types of bones is the carpometacarpal joint found between? Two types of bones. Yeah, so Nicole's totally right. Probably a couple of us are, are still typing too. The carpometacarpal joint is between the carpal bones, that's the wrist bones, and the metacarpal bones. Those are the ones in the palm. So here, I'll do what one of my groups did, kind of colored in the little box. The carpometacarpal joint is the one that I find right here on this side, and the one that I find right here on my other side, the carpometacarpal joint where these little carpal bones interact with my metacarpal bones. There's my first one. I want to jump down to this joint right here. This joint is where I see those metacarpal bones interacting with my phalanges out here. Again, I know I'm going to make you type a whole bunch. 
what would the name of this joint be between my phalanges and my metacarpals? What would I call that joint? Perfect. Yep, several of us are typing. Super long one. That one was really mean. I think that's actually the longest one, too. Shame on Dr. Aulis. The metacarpophalangeal joint is where the metacarpal bones that make up the palm of your hand meet the phalanges that make up your fingers. These are going to be that, that first knuckle, if you will, uh, the big bump that's kind of on your hand before you go into the fingers. That's this metacarpophalangeal joint. When I talk about the joints that, that make up your knuckles, which we're all going to now want to, to crack, right? We want to pop our knuckles. What's the technical name for the knuckle joint? These ones out here, what do I call these knuckle joints? Change colors. Yeah, so, so my knuckle joints are called the interphalangeal joints. Interphalangeal, meaning I'm in between the phalanges. Oops. In between the phalanges. So the interphalangeal joints, that's the ones that make up the knuckles in your fingers. The metacarpophalangeal joint is the one that makes up the knuckles on your hand. And we've got this metacarpo, or, or excuse me, carpometacarpal joint right here between the carpals and the metacarpals. Then in between each of these little bones that I see here making up your wrist, these uh, little joints in between all of them, these are called the intercarpal joints in between the carpals. So let's color that one too. My intercarpal joints are all the little lines in between these bones that I'm finding here in the carpals. So the intercarpal joints in between the carpal jo uh, bones, interphalangeal joints between the phalanges, metacarpophalangeal between the metacarpals and the phalanges carpo metacarpal between the carpals and the metacarpal bones i know it's super stupid long names right but their names give us an idea of exactly where we find them all of these joints just in the hands but we're done with the hands now so that's nice next joint that we have is this joint that I see right here. This is between, you already told me, the radius on the thumb side and the ulna on the pinky side. This one right here, what's the particular name of this one right here? The one that's down by the wrist. Yeah, so the one that's down by the wrist is my distal radial ulnar joint. So I'm just going to color it like some of my groups did. Distal radial ulnar joint. This word distal means that I'm farther from the attachment point. The word proximal means that I'm closer. So the distal radial ulnar joint is the one that's down here by your hands. It's the space between the radius and the ulna right before your wrist where they, they touch each other. The radius and the ulna though also touch each other up by the elbow. Then I'm going to use that word proximal to describe their, their, that joint's location. So my proximal radial ulnar joint is going to be up here. Where the radius and the ulna interact with each other closer to the attachment point, closer to, to the shoulder. But up at the elbow joint, not only do the radius and the ulna touch each other, the radius and the ulna both also touch the humerus. So the last joints that we had left were the humeroradial joint 
and the humero molar joint? Hey, not a trick question. When I talk about the humero radial joint, that is the humerus and the yeah, Lori's right. Humerus and the radius. A bunch of us climbing, climbing in. Humero radial, humerus and the radius. That means it's going to be the place at the elbow where my radius, which is on the outside, on the thumb side, interacts with my humerus. That'd be this line right here. When I talk about the humero ulnar joint, that's going to be this line over here where the ulna and the humerus interact with each other. So humeral radial joint on the radius side or the lateral side, humeral ulnar on the ulnar side where the humerus interacts with the ulna. What are our thoughts about joints of the arm? Thumbs up, thumbs down, questions. Ariel's having a dance party. She's feeling great. I'll take it. Ooh, that, that cake looks good, Nicole. Piece of cake, probably, right? It was a piece of cake. At least one thing has to be a piece of cake in, in this lab. If you guys remember the names of your bones, I, I would like to think that uh, these joint locations should kind of be a piece of cake because they're all named based on the bones there. Yeah, Hannah feels like it's not too bad. Perfect. Okay. So I'm wrapped up with the activities that we did together as groups, which means we should move into then some of the topics that we said we wanted to talk about. Uh, let me just mention, well, no one really asked me for it. This is the model that we looked at last week. You're labeling it again this week because there's one new thing that we're labeling on this model. That one new thing is called an arachnoid granulation. Arachnoid granulations are these little bubbles that you see right here. This is an arachnoid granulation. Last week we talked about how this seafoam green color right here, this is the arachnoid mater. There are places where the arachnoid mater makes these little bubbles called granulations, or sometimes, let me give you the other name you might see when you do a Google search. The other name you might see for these is villi. It's the same thing. Arachnoid granulations or arachnoid villi, same thing. These are little bubbles. It's places where the fluid that was in the subarachnoid space can actually be drained into the dural venous sinus. Now we talked about these two places in, in our group work activity. Remind me though, this place right here, the dural venous sinus, what's normally found in here? Yeah, normally the dural venous sinus, which uh, to answer Jacqueline's question, uh, this space here, yes, this is, is our big blood vessel, our big empty space. This, this would normally have blood inside of it. These little granulations, these little bubbles, are places where I can leak the fluid from the subarachnoid space into this place that normally has blood. Remind me, if we remember, what was the kind of fluid in the subarachnoid space? What's floating around inside here? Yeah, good. Nicole did the abbreviation. We're not typing that whole long word, right? This subarachnoid space here, the, the space underneath the arachnoid mater, this is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid, which is the same stuff that's inside the brain in those ventricles that we talked about, when we're done with it inside the brain, we release it into the subarachnoid space because when it's in the subarachnoid space, we can then send it through these granulations, through these bubbles, back into the bloodstream so that it doesn't build up, so that we don't have too much of it floating around our brain or in our brain. We're actually gonna talk about in lecture next week when we're working on the brain stuff, 
we're going to talk about a condition where you have too much cerebrospinal fluid. That condition is something called hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus, or as, as people sometimes call it, water on the brain. It's not actually water. It's a buildup of cerebrospinal fluid. If I have too much cerebrospinal fluid, it can either put pressure on my brain or cause my skull to expand. It's bad news. Either way, not good. So these little villi right here, these little granulations right here, take that cerebrospinal fluid, dump it into a blood vessel, and that sends it back into the circulation away from the brain. So the only new thing on this model are these bubbles. Everything else is review. Just make sure that we know that these are our arachnoid granulations. Their job is basically to, to recycle cerebrospinal fluid. Take it from here back into the bloodstream. I use blood to build cerebrospinal fluid, so it's perfect. I can, can recycle it, reuse it. Here's a couple of pictures that I'll mention. Again, we, we weren't particularly interested in, in these, but remember when we did our first activity, and I ask you to label things like a cerebral hemisphere. Get my pencil out here. There we go. A cerebral hemisphere, which is half of the brain, or areas like that duck face. Circle my duck face inside here. Things like the cerebellum and the pons. What you're looking at on these images that you're labeling the ventricles on is we're looking at where they would be inside the brain. So the two lateral ventricles are the biggest ventricles. These are the ones that, that are inside the cerebral hemispheres. When cerebrospinal fluid is made in, in these lateral ventricles and it's done being in the lateral ventricle, its goal is going to be to go down into the third ventricle. And the third ventricle is the one that's inside the duck face. So inside the thalamus, here's my third ventricle. To get from the lateral ventricles that look like a horseshoe from the side, to go down here into my third ventricle, my duck face, does anyone remember which of these two things I use? To go from a lateral ventricle into a third ventricle? I don't know if we had a chance to do that yet. So my little tube right here, my little tube right here is actually the interventricular foramen. Yep, the interventricular foramen. It was mean, right? There was another long word for you. <laughs> yeah, Hannah says she hates spelling. No, I, I, I feel you. There's a lot of weird stuff to spell. It's kind of hard to see on my picture right here. And later when we pull up visible body, it'll probably be easier to see. There's a little tube that goes from the third ventricles, or excuse me, from the lateral ventricles down into the third ventricle. These are is called the interventricular foramen. The tube in between my, my two lateral ventricles down into the third ventricle. Once I'm in the third ventricle, which is in the duck face in the thalamus, I go down to that fourth ventricle, which you can see right here. Now I'll point out the fourth ventricle that we see here, kind of looking like a triangle. That's this thing right here as well. So the fourth ventricle is actually kind of like a big diamond shape in between the pons and the cerebellum. So I'm seeing half of it right here from the side, when you look at it, if I was looking straight through your head at your ventricles, here's what that fourth ventricle would look like down here at the bottom. To get from the third ventricle, which is up high, into the fourth ventricle that I see right here, we use a little tube. You can see that one right here, or we can see that little tube right here. This is called the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct. That one goes from the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle. Okay, here is a study pro tip for us. Study pro tip. Um, on page, let's see what page, we're on page one, I guess, of your packet. 
how there's a big long list of descriptions for, for different structures. I recommend rather than memorizing all of the words on the list here uh, and those descriptions on the list on page one, I recommend starting with memorizing the pictures, the stuff that I can see on, on these pictures. If I know where stuff is on the picture, I can come up with a description of what it does. So what, what I mean by that, if I know that this thing right here, which is the same thing as this thing right here, if I know this is the cerebral aqueduct, I'm going to know that the cerebral aqueduct connects the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. I mean, if you want to memorize that, you can, but I also have to know where it's found. So if I can label everything on the picture, then describe using the picture where things are or what it looks like they do, that's gonna save me some brain space of, of having to go through and find everything. Nicole asked a, a good question, and actually um, on, on this model, I or on these pictures, excuse me, I can't really see the choroid plexus. So go ahead and cross that one off. Um, that is a leftover from the in-class model that we would use to show you the ventricles. So go ahead and cross that off. If we had it shown on these pictures here, I'll show you, it'd be, it'd be right here. Choroid plexus is blood vessels that, that I find inside each of my, um, each of my ventricles. So I have this really ugly model here. Now I gotta like find it for you. If you've never seen it in person in class, like there's no way you're gonna be able to label it correctly. So let me pull it up and show you. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Let's see, application. We're gonna look at this one right here. Okay, check out this nastiness right here. This is our in-class model of the ventricles. If you see it in 3D, it helps, like you can figure it out. But when you're looking at it just on a picture, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So here's my lateral ventricles, those horseshoe shaped ones. Here's that third ventricle, the duck shaped one. And then it goes into the fourth ventricle down here. See this album looking stuff that I see right here. I see a little bit of it right here. That pink bubble gum looking stuff, that's the choroid plexus. Um, if we were in class, in person, looking at this model, I could absolutely ask you about the choroid plexus. But we're not in person. We're not looking at this model. So I'm not going to ask you to identify where the choroid plexus is on a picture. Uh, but again, the choroid plexus is just this pink stuff that I see. It's leaky blood vessels that are inside each of the ventricles. Here's the third ventricle. Here's some in that lateral ventricle. There's a little bit here in the fourth ventricle. Um, so you're not labeling it on an image. You do need to know that it's the leaky blood vessels that I use to make my cerebrospinal fluid. Let me look back at my chat here. Um, so Jacqueline, you need to know what it does. You don't need to be able to identify it. Um, yeah, and so just back to Christina's question to clarify, again, we don't, see choroid plexus on those um, those images. We used to include a picture of this model in the packet, but again, since we're not in person, um, we're not going to ask you to label a model that is notoriously hard, even if we are in person. Um, Gloria is asking about next semester. Do any of you guys know? I, I hope some people know. Yeah, so we we are virtual next semester. I, I was hoping that that it wasn't just faculty that knew that. Yeah, so next semester is going to be virtual again, unfortunately. <laughs> Sad for all of us. I I hate it as much as you guys do. So it it's pain. <laughs> okay, so Ariel said it's on TCC News. I know um, too. When you go to register for classes, it should say the same thing that it it's going to be unfortunately, all, all online. All right, let me go back to our lesson here. Oops. Any other 
ventricle questions that we have before we move on to cranial nerves. Again, just ignore that choroid plexus. Um, we're not labeling it. But here, here's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. If we don't label it, there's a better chance I'm going to ask you what it does. So make sure we know that the choroid plexuses are the leaky blood vessels that make cerebrospinal fluid. We're going to talk about them again in, in lecture, in lesson number 11. Uh, but now is a good time to learn because it'll probably be on that homework assignment you have. Yeah, I feel you, Ariel, just trying to soak it in. <laughs> I, I feel you. Lots of new stuff here. Okay, so I know I got some questions about cranial nerves. Here are the names of the cranial nerves. Now, the packet looks super scary, um, but the good news is we did not mix up the order of the cranial nerves when you're, when you're looking at that table. You can write their names in order as you see them here on my screen. So the, the names of the cranial nerves, starting with number one. By the way, just for my reference, how many of us never learned Roman numerals? Can you, can you let me know in the chat? How many of you never learned Roman numerals? Or did we all learn them in school? I usually have about a third to half of my students that never learned Roman numerals. I guess we're in the half that did. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, well, I have them listed here with the Roman numerals. You will probably see on the homework assignment a mix of Roman numerals and Arabic numbers, the normal numbers we're used to. So just be aware of that. We've got it listed as both in the lab packet for you. So we kept the, the, the nerves in order. You just have to fill in their names. So cranial nerve number one is the olfactory nerve. The olfactory nerve, we'll go through, I guess, we'll just label them together as, as we work on it. Cranial nerve number one, is the cranial nerve that's found the closest to the front of the brain. So I'm gonna draw a black line up here. This is the front of the brain. Cranial nerve number one, you can see really clearly, it's these two things right here. Cranial nerve number one, its name is the olfactory nerve. Olfaction is the process of smelling. So cranial nerve number one, by the way, this is good flashcard stuff. Cranial nerve number one is the olfactory nerve. It's the smelling nerve. Cranial nerve number two is called the optic nerve. Now, the optic nerve has a thing in it, let me type for you, called the optic chiasm. And I'll, I'll see if we can find this invisible body, the optic chiasm. This is a, an X-shaped structure where the optic nerve crisscrosses. So the ability for your left eye to see, we actually process a lot of the visual information from your left eye in the right side of your brain. And we process a lot of the information from your right side in, or in your right eye from the left side of your brain. So there's this thing called the optic chiasm. And I'm gonna actually add it to my little picture here. So here's, let me circle first so you can see. Here's cranial nerve number two right here. What I like to see, or what I, I, I like better to help me recognize it, I'm going to add a little X here. This little X here is the optic chiasm. Uh, uh, chiasm is an X. The optic chiasm. So what I see over here crosses over and goes to my brain over here. What I see over here crosses over and, and goes back to the other side of my brain. So here's what I see on this model of cranial nerve number two. You will see it much better on um, other images that show this X, the optic chiasm, cranial nerve number two. Cranial nerve number three is called the oculomotor nerve. Oculomotor. This motor part tells me it's a movement nerve. Oculo tells me I'm moving the eyeball. Cranial nerve number three is this little thing right here. Let's see if I can circle it. One and two. There's both of them. 
Cranial nerve number three. Cranial nerve number three comes out of the top of the pons. So neither of these are really on the brainstem. They're just their own special structures. Cranial nerve number three is at the top of the pons. Here's the bump. That is the pons. So cranial nerve number three, these two little things right here. Okay, here is a group of nerves to learn together. Number three, number four, and number six. All of these have the same function. All of these do eye movement. Three, four, and six. These are all cranial nerves that move the eye. They control different muscles that we're gonna learn in our last week of lab. So oculomotor nerve, here's number three right here. That controls one set of eyeball muscles. The trochlear nerve, that's number four, is this little one that I see here, and I can see it right here. I'll draw a line to it, won't try to circle it. Here's number four, right there. Cranial nerve number four is the smallest cranial nerve, and it actually comes from the back side of the brainstem, so it's reaching around from the back to come toward the front. The trochlear nerve, number four. We're gonna jump down here to number six, this one's number six right here called abducens. That's the last cranial nerve that, that does the eyeball movement for us. So number six right here, the abducens nerve. I'll try to write a number six. Oh, look at that, that worked. So here's number six right here and right here, number six. Go back to number five right here. Number five is the biggest cranial nerve. So I can see it on this model like a big circle here. But I also have models that show it that I like much better, that show it and it looks like this. Cranial nerve number five, let's write a five in there. Cranial nerve number five is the largest cranial nerve. So you can see it's got this big place where it starts from. It's called the trigeminal nerve because it has three branches, trigeminal, one, two, and three. They all go to different places in your face. Here, let me turn on my camera really fast to show you a good way to help you remember where trigeminal nerve is. I know I'm really small in the corner when it comes. Okay, it's there. Um, you can take three fingers and spread them out. The trigeminal nerve, if you take those three fingers along your jaw and spread them out on your face, kind of like this, you can see. One of the branches goes up to your, your facial skin, your forehead skin. One of them goes to the, the maxilla, so your upper teeth. And one of them goes down to the bottom, to your mandible, so the teeth down low. Down low, in the middle, and up to your forehead. There are three branches of the trigeminal nerve. So really big nerve. You can see on, on the sketch that I made here that it's got those three branches, which you can do with your finger going to those three different places. We already talked about number six. Here's number six right here. Then we move number seven. Now there's two little nerves right here. and I know they're close together. Um, you're just going to have to, when you're looking at labels on here, look at which side we're pointing at. If we're pointing at inside, oh, I'm borrowing my husband's mouse, it's dying here. There we go. If I'm pointing at the nerve on the inside, that's number seven. If I'm pointing at the nerve on the outside, that's number eight. So number eight on the outside, number seven more toward the middle. So let's type that. There's an eight. There's a seven. Got a seven and an eight. Real nerve number seven is the facial nerve that collects sensory information from the face. It sends motor directions for facial expression. Cranial nerve number eight is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Vestibulocochlear is a long name, uh, but it tells us the two parts of the ear that we get information from that goes here. Vestibulo is a place called the vestibule that helps us with balance. 
cochlear means the cochlea that helps us with hearing so cranial nerve number eight the one on the outside here vestibulocochlear nerve hearing and balance then we go to the one right below it here this is cranial nerve number nine Cranial nerve number nine is called the glossopharyngeal nerve. Glossopharyngeal means tongue and throat. Glosso is tongue. Pharynx is, is part of your throat. So the tongue throat nerve helps us with movement of the tongue and some of those throat muscles. That's number nine. Put a little line here for number nine. Now, Number nine is the one on the outside. Keep that in mind. The one in the middle here, I'll give you its number while we're at it. The one in the middle is number 12. Side. Number 12 there in the middle. So number nine is on the outside. Number 12 is in the middle. Glossopharyngeal, number nine. Down below it, this top part right here is cranial nerve number 10 called the vagus nerve. Cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve. This word vagus means wandering. Uh, this nerve actually goes all the way down uh, into your abdomen and it helps to control some of those digestive system organs. So it starts all the way up in your upper neck and goes wanders all down into your abdomen. That's why it's called the vagus nerve. So here's number 10 right here. Down below it, right here, is number 11. Now, cranial nerve number 11, here's as close as we come to a controversy in, in anatomy. There are some scientists, some anatomists, who would say that cranial nerve number 11 is actually not a cranial nerve. They would say that it's a spinal cord nerve because it's all the way down here. We are kind of out of the brain stem at this point. So they, to some extent, they do have a point. But this little thing right here for our class, we are labeling this as cranial nerve number 11, the accessory nerve. Let me add a little box around it. If it'll work, try again. I tried too hard and I failed. Sorry, guys. There we go. Cranial nerve number 11, the bottom half, the accessory nerve. Or sometimes when you do a Google search, you're going to see it called the spinal accessory nerve, number 11. The last one is cranial nerve number 12, the hypoglossal nerve. And that was this one that we had up here. So number 9 and number 12, they're neighbors to each other. 9, 10, and 11 are along the outside of the brainstem. Number 12 is in the middle. So number 12 in the middle, the hypoglossal nerve. Again, we've got glossal in its name, so it means tongue. This is another one that helps us with the tongue. What questions do we have at the moment? What thoughts do we have about cranial nerves? Correct. Yep. Gloria asked about um, about number 12. Number 12 helps us with, with moving those tongue muscles. Yes. Hypoglossal means below the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> Ariel said her mind's blown. I get it. Hey, let me do something with you to help us with our cranial nerves. Let's see if I can get this right. Ooh, okay. We are going to use a clown face to help us with the functions of our cranial nerves. So um, find yourself a blank piece of paper or somewhere where you have enough space to draw on it. We are going to Start drawing a clown face here. Wish my mouse wasn't dying. Okay, so here's what I want you to start with. I want you to start with the circle for your clown's face. 
I want you to put number one where there would be a nose, and number two where there would be eyes. Put a circle around those things. That's going to help us here as we um, as we do our clown face. Now, if you want to get a few different colors, we will um, we'll do red, on, at least on my screen. You can do whatever color you want to. For me, red is going to be special senses, or sense, I'll just call it sensory. Sensory nerves are going to be red. I'm going to make my motor nerves blue. And then we've got some here, we'll do this color appropriate. Purple equals mixed nerves. So we've got some nerves, some cranial nerves that just collect sensory information. I'm going to color those ones red. We've got some cranial nerves that just send motor information. I'm going to color those blue. And we've got some cranial nerves that do both sensory and motor. I'm going to make those ones purple. So we're going to draw a clown face. We're going to color code it to get an idea of, of what these nerves do based on their location and based on their color. So let's we'll start with cranial nerve number one. Cranial nerve number one is the olfactory nerve. The olfactory nerve is the nerve that helps us with the sense of smell. So if you're doing the color coding thing with me, go ahead and color in your clown's one nose red. Sense of smell, cranial nerve number one. Okay. Cranial nerve number two is called the optic nerve. That helps us with the sense of seeing. Either you can color in your circle red, making a creepy clown here, right? Or you can write the number two in red. Cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve that helps us with the sense of vision. Now remember, I told you to learn cranial nerves number three, four, and six together as a group. Three, four, and six. What did we say was the function, the general function, of number three, number four, and number six? All of them do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Three, four, and six all help me to move my eyeball. So I'm going to pull out my movement color, my motor color, and I'm going to put number three. So let's see if I can get it to write. Number three. Cranial nerve number three helps me to move a muscle that's on top of the eyeball. So oculomotor nerve, it's, it's controlling a muscle up there. Number four is the trochlear nerve. That's going to control a muscle that's actually on the, the outside of the eyeball. So number four there. And number six is going to control a muscle that's on the, the lower outside of the eyeball. Cranial nerve number three, number four, and number six. All of them help me with eyeball movement. So oculomotor, trochlear, and uh, abducens. These are my three eyeball moving um, cranial nerves. Now at this point, we switch from having a sensory nerve or a motor nerve to our first mixed nerve. Cranial nerve number five is our first nerve that's going to, to be a mixed nerve. That was the one, remember, that we, we held our fingers up on the side of our face. So we're going to put a really big number five in the cheeks of our clown, kind of like where the edges of his smile would be, all the way on the outside. Big number fives, because cranial nerve number five is getting information from all kinds of places on the face, here on the upper scalp, kind of down here on the jaw. We're getting information from all over the place. We're also controlling the, the muscles that help us with things like chewing, for example. So the ones that are up here on top and the ones that are, are down here. Cranial nerve number five, the trigeminal nerve. That one does sensory and motor stuff. We did number six up here with our eyeball, helping us to move the eyeball. That brings us to number seven, 
Number seven is another mixed nerve. And number seven is controlling facial muscles and it's helping with the sense of taste. I'm gonna put number seven out here with my number five. Facial muscles out here. I guess I'll put it inside the number five over here. That looks terrible. We're gonna, just gonna have to type a number seven over there. <laughs> Cranial nerve number seven also helps me with moving my facial muscles and it helps me with the sense of taste. Cranial nerve number eight was my one that helped me with hearing and balance, vestibulocochlear. So this is just a sensory nerve. I'm gonna go back to my sensory color and I'm gonna put big number eight for the ears on my clown. Cranial nerve number eight helps me with the process of hearing. Cranial nerve number eight. Cranial nerve number nine was the one that was called the glossopharyngeal nerve, the tongue throat nerve. This is another one that does sensory and motor. It helps me to taste, but it also helps to control the process of, of swallowing. So I'm gonna put a number nine for the mouth on my clown. Oh, that's absolutely terrible. We're gonna try again. I'm sure your number nine will look better than mine. Let's start with that. Number nine for a mouth on my clown here. Cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. I taste in the mouth and I help with the throat as I swallow, glossopharyngeal. Cranial nerve number 10 was the vagus nerve, the wandering nerve. So what I'm gonna do for my clown here is I am going to make some number 10s that wander or that go down his, his, his chest like buttons on his coat. So I'm gonna try to write some number 10s here. Let's see if I can do it. Oh. Number 10 buttons, see those going down? So my, my clown has buttons that are going down, uh, down his shirt, cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve. This is another one that's a mixed nerve, by the way. So sensory and motor information, it's a mixed nerve. Cranial nerve number 11 is a nerve called the accessory nerve. And this is a nerve that controls the movement of muscles that would be found in the same place as an accessory that you would wear around your neck, for example. So my clown is looking a little sad without his bow tie. I'm gonna give my clown a bow tie really fast. Let's draw him a bow tie. That's not too shabby, actually. A little bow tie for him. And his bow tie is gonna have cranial nerve number 11 in it, because it's an accessory. I'm gonna write my 11s. The accessory nerve is a motor nerve. So I'm gonna color in his whole bow tie, or you can write the number 11 in your, your motor color. My clown has a blue bow tie. Cranial nerve number 11, the accessory nerve that controls the movement of neck muscles, muscles that you'd find next to an accessory, accessory nerve. All that leaves for me is number 12, cranial nerve number 12. That's the hypoglossal nerve. That was the under the tongue nerve. So in the middle of your number nine, Let's put a number 12 because we're also inside the mouth. Remember, this was the glossopharyngeal. I put a little number 12. This is a motor nerve. So little number 12 inside the mouth. That's my, uh, my hypoglossal nerve, the last one there. And with that, we have made a super creepy clown. But maybe it will help us remember what some of those cranial nerves do? Anybody think this might help them? <laughs> if this totally doesn't help you, that's that's totally fine. Yeah, Ariel says her clown looks weird. Yep. Like my clown looks weird. It would look better if we were in class together. It's uh, 
it's tough to draw with a mouse. So hopefully yours looks weird, but in a good way, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Jerry needs a little cross-eyed. Well, good news is too, you can always go back and rewatch uh, the video and see if that if it makes any more sense. But honestly, I mean, if you would rather make flashcards to memorize the functions, you can. The goal of, of my, my clown face cranial nerve thing here, though, the goal of this is to maybe save you a little bit of memorized space. If I can memorize a picture of the clown, I know that number one is in his nose, number two is in his eyes, numbers three, four, and six are around the eye, moving it, number eight is his ears, any of these, these numbers help us to remember functions, it's helpful. If it doesn't help you, just ignore it. It's pretty creepy. Let's, let's forget about it. <laughs> All right, we've done cranial nerves. We've talked a little bit about ventricles. Uh, I think then what we said we wanted to do was bone markings and muscles of the arm. Is that there? Is that what you guys want to go do? What do you want to start with? Bones or muscles? I got one vote for muscles. Okay. Two votes for muscles. I'm going to pull up visible body really fast. Yeah, lots of muscle votes. Okay. Let me get my visible body loaded. I think that will help us. I'll go ahead and share my screen while it's working on it. Yeah, so when um, yeah, Nicole brings up the point um, with the muscles, and here's what I'll mention with the muscles. We're using, um, you're labeling pictures on the muscle man that we have in the lab. I, I think I've told you guys before, I kind of call him yoga in the park guy. Um, he is not standing in anatomical position, which I know we don't like, it's frustrating. Um, but what I would encourage you to do, again, especially since we have no one around us, um, to, to watch us while we're doing things on our homework or, or kind of in general. Um, what I would recommend doing is putting yourself in the position that he's in. Sorry, let's see if it, oops, okay, let me reshare here. I moved to a different screen and it crashed on me. Um, I would recommend you putting yourself in that, in the position that, that our, our model is in. So when you're in that position, you've got one hand that's kind of balled up toward the sky. The, the front side of your arm, of your forearm, is um, facing toward the sky. The other one is kind of rotated to the side. I know it, it's not ideal, but if you use yourself to figure out front versus back, that might, might help things. Apologies, I should have loaded it earlier. All right, here we go. Okay, so today's today's focus, rotate him. Okay. Today's focus is the arm and the forearm. So when we are looking at these regions, let's pull it up. Dive into the forearm here. I'm gonna take off some connective tissue. Okay. When we're looking at the arm and the forearm, there's a couple that we, we know pretty well already. The, the one in your in your arm region, remember in anatomy, the arm is the upper part. The arm is the biceps brachii muscle. Biceps, its name tells me it has two attachment points. So we've got one and two, the two heads of the bicep muscle. Down below it, we have several muscles uh, in the forearm. Now, we don't have to know all of the muscles in the forearm. That nerve is annoying me. Let's see if I can get it away. Nope, undo. I keep doing the same thing. 
There we go. Sorry, Dr. Ellis is being a little anal. Just going to be honest here. Okay. When you look at the forearm, there are extra muscles we don't have to know. So you don't have to label them in your packet. You don't have to know them in visible body. We're going to go through and we're going to look together to see if we can find the ones uh, together that, that we need to find. So let's start with my one here on the outside. Oh, come on, visible body. There we go. Okay. First muscle that we're looking at right here is something called the brachioradialis. The way you're going to identify brachioradialis is it attaches to the upper part of the arm and then it goes down into the forearm. Brachioradialis wraps around from the, the arm at the top, let's see if I can get a better view, uh, down into the forearm. We have a big one in the middle of the arm called flexor carpi radialis. Now, here's a note that I want you guys to make for yourself as you're studying. The front side of your body is where we find the flexor muscles. So the flexor muscles, the ones that do flexion, that make the size smaller, those are all found on the front side. Flexor carpi radialis attaches down at the radius side of my arm. So I've also got, let me rotate a little bit, next to it I also have this one up here. Nope, where'd he go? We also have a flexor carpi ulnaris that I can probably, must be able to see better on the other side. Uh, flexor carpi radialis is on the radius side. Ulnaris must be hiding on me. Let's see. Do we have, maybe we don't have to know Ulnaris. Bear with me. No, we do. We can see it better on that model than we can on visible body. Right there. Okay. So wrapping around, zoom out so we can get context. Right here, flexor carpi ulnaris. Can we see him attaching right here on the front side? Flexor carpi radialis. So they both originate right here. The one that goes toward the radius side, flexor carpi radialis. The one that goes toward the ulna side is ulnaris over there. I, think I missed a comment. Uh, okay, so let me put this question to the class. Jacqueline asked if we can do the, the packet. Would we rather just do the packet or do you want to do it here in visible body? Okay, Ariel's voting packet, packet, okay. Um, then I'll switch over for you. Let me pull that up. I brought in those pictures. Okay, so I think this is, is the lower picture on your packet, right? Yeah, this is the lower one it looks like. This is where uh, I mentioned to you to um, put yourself in the position of our, our friend here, uh, our yoga in the park guy. So this is his palm. Get my pointer back. This is his palm. He's got his, his fingers balled up and he's holding them toward the sky. So imagine that you're standing with, with your arm upward. You've got your fingers balled up and you're pointing toward the sky. This is the front side of your forearm. This is the front side of your arm. This is the back side of your arm. So to give you a frame of reference, again, if you ball up your fist, hold it up toward the sky with, with the, the back side raised toward the sky. This is the front side of your arm. This is the back side. Front side of the forearm, the back side would be behind it. Let's start up here. This big one that I see right here, is the big muscle that's on the front side of your arm. So let me get my marker back right here. This muscle right here is biceps brachii because this is the, the front side of your arm. The humerus is inside here. Here's the, the top 
or, or the front, if you will, biceps brachii. Back here behind it, here's my triceps brachii. Triceps brachii. That went a little too far. Triceps brachii. Then we move into the forearm area. Now, best frame of reference I can give you for anything that you're working on labeling, see down here in the palm of the hand how there's this white uh, connective tissue here. This is part of my tendon. This tendon right here is the attachment point for a muscle called palmaris longus. It goes into the palm of the hand. So right here is my tendon, which means that this right here, which is the muscle that this tendon attaches to, this is the palmaris longus muscle right here. So this one, line died. Come on. Okay. This one right here is palmaris longus. It goes into the palm of the hand, palmaris longus. Now next to it are my two flexor muscles that, that we were just looking at. Flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. This carpi part right here is telling me that we attach to the carpal bones. So we're looking for muscles that go down and attach to the carpal bones. This one right here is the muscle that attaches to the carpal bone on the thumb side. The one that's on the thumb side, is that going to be radialis or ulnaris? Which one's going to be on the thumb side? Yeah, exactly. When we're talking about the thumb side, that's the side where, where I see the radius. So since that's the side where I see the radius, that's going to be where I find the muscle flexor carpi radialis. Radialis, that's on the radius side. On the opposite side of palmaris longus, so here's flexor carpi radialis. When we go to the opposite side of palmaris longus, when we go over here, I've got my muscle that attaches out here on the, the carpals, on the outer side, on the ulna side, I'm looking at flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor carpi ulnaris on the ulna side. So flexor carpi ulnaris attaches to the carpals on the ulna side, flexor carpi radialis attaches to the carpals on the radius side. By the way, I would 100% recommend as you're studying these things too, put your forearm out in front of you and try moving around fingers, seeing if you can feel when different muscles contract. When you flex up your entire palm, so your entire hand, toward the middle of your arm, you can kind of even feel the tendon on palmaris longus if you feel it when you move back and forth. Flexor carpi radialis is more on, on the, the thumb side or the lateral side if you're in anatomical position. And flexor carpi ulnaris is more on the medial side. But that palmaris longus tendon, you can absolutely feel that in your arm, kind of down in your wrist region. So, so consider that. That big long one right here, we can absolutely identify palmaris because we can see its tendon. Radialis on the thumb side, ulnaris on the pinky side. Any questions on this one? Okay. Thumbs up on this one. Here's what I'll mention too. Have we learned this muscle yet? I think we have. The big one in the chest. Mm, the sternocleidomastoid one's up a little bit higher. Have we done? We did muscles. Yeah, that's right, Jacqueline. Uh, we did muscles of the the thorax and the abdomen, right? This is the pectoralis major. Yep, Christine is absolutely right. Pectoralis major. That's that one right there. Um, I I don't know if we have 
have done this one yet. Have, have we done this one here? I'm drawing its edge right here. Have we done this one yet? On the side. So we might not have. On bedding, we have not yet. This one right here is called serratus anterior. Serratus anterior. Uh, this one gets its name because it looks like a serrated knife. Serratus anterior. Yeah, so that must be coming. That must be on our back. The week that we do the muscles of the back. So as a heads up, the little serrated knife one that's down here. That's serratus anterior. Here's pectoralis major. Um, have we done latissimus dorsi? I can't. I can't remember what order we do them in. We probably haven't. Kicks and giggles. I'll label that one for you too. Coming later. Hey, if you want to start labeling these on your packet now, um, we're going to be doing them in a couple of weeks. So just a couple of extra ones. Latissimus dorsi attaches to the humerus as well. Here's my serratus anterior, the serrated knife one, and then pectoralis major on, on the front. Okay, so Jacqueline's saying we actually did. So we'll, we'll have to review them all at some point, right? So why not today? <laughs> all right, let's go to that other picture. The other picture gives you an idea. I'm, I'm doing an aerial look here. So here's the head. Remember I told you we balled up the fist and we held it up in the air. So here's the back side of the arm. This arm over here, notice, is a little bit turned at an angle. So here's the back side of the hand. We can again see some of that stuff on, on the back. Um, to give us a frame of reference, this muscle right here is biceps brachii. And back behind it is triceps brachii. So let's label those to give us a, a sense of orientation triceps brachii on the back side biceps brachii and here comes some arrows biceps brachii triceps brachii i will type them again instead of making huge arrows triceps brachii on one arm biceps brachii on the other arm right here and right here Biceps and triceps. When you're trying to orient yourself in the picture, plan to just go ahead and start with those ones right away. Hey, we talked about the deltoid muscle when we were talking about ways to name muscles. When we're naming, uh, when we have a, a muscle like the deltoid, does anyone remember how that one got its, got its, sh its name? Totally half said it there. <laughs> Yeah, based on a Greek letter, right? The the Greek letter called delta. Uh, the Greek letter delta is a triangle. So the deltoid is a triangle-shaped muscle. I can see that one right here in the shoulder. So here's the triangle. Let's see if my mouse will let me draw it. Here's my triangle in the shoulder, the deltoid muscle that I see up here. So the deltoid muscle in the shoulder, on the back side of the arm, the triceps, on the front side of the arm, the biceps. You can kind of see the deltoid here, though it's a little hard, harder to see on this side. So there's the deltoid muscle, here's those triceps, here's those biceps. Now we need to label some of, of those other muscles that we've talked about from before. One of them that we looked at in visible body that we didn't look at on our, our model yet was brachioradialis. Brachioradialis, what I told you about this one, is that this one goes from the humerus, it goes from the upper part of the arm down toward the radius side of the forearm. When I'm looking at muscle man, we can see it in, in both places. Here's where I think we can see it the clearest, right here. This right here, so let's draw a line, put a name on it. Okay, this right here is brachioradialis. Brachioradialis. We attach on the humerus, we go down to the radius. This is going to help us to rotate our arm a little bit. 
When we're looking here on the top side of the arm, I can also see the brachioradialis. Here it is attached to the humerus, extending down toward the radius. So the other place I can see it, my favorite is right here. This is where I like it best. But the other place I can see it is, is up here. So let's draw a little line for ourselves. We've also got brachioradialis up top, brachioradialis. The big one that I see on the back side of the arm that's going to help me to, to find other ones is this one right here. Notice this big muscle uh, in the forearm that's in the very center. This one right here is called extensor digitorum. Extensor digitorum. Let's get a label on it. Extensor digitorum. Spell that right. Digitorum. This one helps me to extend the fingers. So it's on the back side. The back side of the arm, when I pull my hand backwards, that's extension. Extensor digitorum, pulling my hand backwards. Extensor digitorum. Next to it, we're going to have extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi ulnaris. So we're back to the radius and the ulna side of things. It's a little bit hard to see extensor carpi ulnaris, going to be honest with you. Here's radialis. I'm going to abbreviate here. Extensor carpi radialis. We're on the radius side. Ulnaris, let's see if I... I guess ulnaris, we can kind of see it there. We can't see its attachment site, but... Extensor carpi ulnaris on the ulna side. Here's my, my study pro tip for you. When you're trying to figure out radialis and ulnaris, if I have a pin or I have, have a marking right here on this one, this one's always extensor digitorum. Make sure we know where extensor digitorum is. If I have something that's pointing to something on the ulna side of this muscle, Assume we're pointing to extensor carpi ulnaris. Assume that's what we're going for. If I have something on the radius side of extensor digitorum, assume we're going for extensor carpi radialis. Unless we're seeing the larger one, that larger one is brachioradialis. So the large one, brachioradialis. But if we're on either side here of extensor digitorum, just use your critical thinking skills. Is it the radius side? or the ulna side to help you with labeling those. I know we're soaking it in. Yeah, so the bottom one is a little bit more tricky. Um, are, are we talking about down here? What we're looking at down here? Yeah, so... Um, that's a little bit more tricky because we're starting to see, we've got some flexors that we're seeing here and some extensors. The problem is when we go from front to back, we get a little bit mixed up. Um, they all, I mean, your, your arms are all one thing together. Um, what we're probably seeing right here, let me see if I, I'm looking at it. Most likely, this one that I'm pointing to on the very far side, this one right here is most likely, I, I would think, to be flexor carpi ulnaris. Flexor because it's on the front side. This one next to it, I would say, would be most likely to be extensor carpi ulnaris. Because I think this one right here is extensor digitorum. But it's really tough to see for sure. I think it's a much better idea to label them on the on the top one up here. So let me let's see what we talked about. We talked about that one, that one, that one. Extensor digitorum. Flexor, because this this other one's here on the front. Flexor carpi ulnaris and extensor carpi ulnaris. 
Okay, yeah, and Ariel offered a, a great study tip too. Brachioradialis is close to biceps brachii. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great way to think about it too. They both have, have brachii in them, right? They both have brachii or brachio referring to the humerus. I like that. So again, here's my, my pro tips for you. We got to know where extensor digitorum is. If you know where extensor digitorum is in the back, in the middle of the forearm, you should be able to predict where radialis and ulnaris are. They're just on the radius of the ulna side of extensor digitorum. When we're looking at the front side, as long as we can find palmaris longus, you can predict the flexors. The ulnaris on the ulna side or the radialis on the radius side. Front side's got flexors, back side's got extensors. If we know that and we know extensor digitorum and palmaris longus, I think you should be good. That, that's where I stand. That's what I want you to be able to do. If you can do that, I'm happy with you. We've got about 10 more minutes. How would we like to spend those 10 minutes? What would be most helpful for us? Any votes? Muscle movements? Got a couple votes for that, certainly. Okay. Um, so let's do some muscle movement. And um, maybe we can try to hit up the humerus last, Ariel. Let's see if we have some time for that. Um, so, so Gloria's asking about flexors and extensors. Uh, for my friends who are here in class, help me out in the chat. Um, where do we generally find flexors slash where do we generally find extensors? What's the big picture? Did anyone else catch it? I know, I said it fast. Yeah, so flexors on the front. Absolutely, that's good alliteration for us. Flexors found on the front side of the arm. Extensors found on the back side of the arm. Flexors on the front, extensors on the back. And that's actually a really good tie-in. We asked about the movements. That's a really good tie-in for us here when we're talking about the movements. So there's, um, let me go to the ones in particular that we're talking about here. When we talk about, and these are movements of the hand. So keep in mind, we're talking about movements of the hand right here with our flexors and our extensors. If you live on the front side of the forearm, so you're, you're on that side, uh, the, the anterior or the front side, you help to do flexion. If you live on the back side of the forearm, you're doing extension. This is, is movement rules for us, just like location rules. We could do them either way. Here's the nice thing about these muscles with their big long names. You don't even necessarily have to know which side of the arm these muscles are found on to know what their actions are. I promise this is not a trick question. If I'm an extensor, do I flex or extend? I promise it's not a trick question. If I'm an extensor, do I flex or extend? Yeah, absolutely, I extend. I got two right here that have extensor in their name. Sweet, I don't have to memorize their action. I know right away that they help me to extend. If your name says extensor, oh, that was terrible. <laughs> if you extend, hey, not a trick question. If your name says flexor, what do you do? Yeah, flexors, flex, absolutely. Flexors, flex, we're not even a circle. Okay, this last one, Palmaris longus, its name doesn't tell me by itself what it does. So I need to use its location to help me figure out what it does. 
Palmaris longus. Was that on the anterior or the posterior side? Do we remember? Palmaris longus. Fifty fifty split. Who's going to be my tiebreaker? What do we think? My hint is palmaris, like the palm of your hand. Yeah, palmaris is actually found on the front side. Palmaris longus was the one that divided up flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. Palmaris longus, the big one on the front. Extensor digitorum, that was the big one on the back. So palmaris longus is going to be another one since it's on the front that does the process of flexion because it lives on the front. Yeah, so um, Jacqueline brought up a good question. When we're, we're thinking about the picture, when we're thinking about yoga in the park guy, the reason it got a little bit dicey um, was because he's not in anatomical position. So think about anatomical position when you're standing with your palms facing forward, you're standing upright in that awkward position, palmaris longus is going to be on the front. All of these statements that, that we give you about anterior versus posterior, you have to be in anatomical position. So again, when we're, we're trying to answer questions like this, put your arm out with your palm facing forward and feel on you where palmaris longus would be. When you feel it on you, it's facing toward the front. Or when we feel where extensor digitorium is, it would be what's on the back of you when you're in anatomical position. So um, always reference back with these rules that we give you, not to our muscle man who's just loving his yoga in the park. Reference it to you when you're um, in anatomical position. Okay, we just talked about rules of how we move the hand. I'll mention that the other thing that we're talking about movements of this week is movements of, oops, too far, of the radius and the ulna. So basically movements of the forearm. The, the muscles that help us to move the forearm are uh, the, the muscles that live in the arm. So let me pause for a moment and say that more slowly. The muscles that move the forearm, which is the radius and the ulna, these guys live in the arm, which is the humerus. Biceps brachii lives on top of the humerus. But when it attaches or when it contracts, excuse me, when it contracts, what's going to move is the radius and the ulna because it's attached to them. When we were talking about some of those other muscles just now, they were found in your forearm, but they helped you to move your hand. So make sure we're keeping track when we're, we're learning movements. Just recognize that a muscle is always going to move a body part that's distal to it. So a muscle that lives on top of the radius and the ulna, it can't move the radius and the ulna. It can only move the hand. A muscle that lives on top of the humerus can't move the humerus. It can move radius and the ulna because that's distal to it. So things are always moving body parts that are distal to them. Biceps brachii, helping me to move the radius and the ulna, was the biceps brachii when we're in anatomical position, was that anterior or posterior? Biceps brachii. Yeah, several votes for anterior. That is correct. Biceps is on the anterior side of your body. Things that are on the anterior side do flexion. So biceps is going to do flexion. Hey, on the opposite side of your body from biceps is triceps. 
since it's on the opposite side of the body, it does the opposite action. Triceps brachii is going to do extension. Brachioradialis is primarily found on the front side. It it's, uh, starts kind of on the lateral side, but goes toward the front of the arm. So brachioradialis is also going to help with flexion. So our big things to focus on, oh, there's one more movement set, isn't there? Um, flexion and extension. It's always true that the anterior stuff does flexion and the posterior stuff does extension. Think about the location of a muscle to help you know if we're moving the radius or an ulna or whether we're moving a hand. Besides just flexing and extending your hand, by the way, besides bending it forward, which is flexion, and backwards, which is extension, the other thing that we can do with the hand is abduction and adduction. When we talk about abduction and adduction, which of those means that we're moving toward the midline of the body? Which one is bringing things toward the midline? Yeah, adduction means things come toward the midline. Abduction means things come away. If you think about moving toward the midline, you're moving medially. So the muscles that live on the medial side are going to do adduction. They're going to pull stuff back down. Muscles that live on the lateral side do abduction. They're going to pull things up. Now, we've got two muscles here. Which of these, radialis or ulnaris, when I'm in anatomical position, which of these muscles is medial? Which one's closer to the middle when I'm in anatomical position? Yeah, exactly. A couple of us have, have chimed in. Ulnaris, which is, ooh, that's terrible. <laughs> Ulnaris, which is by the ulna. The ulna is the medial bone in the arm. So flexor carpi ulnaris is going to help me to do adduction to pull things toward the middle. Flexor carpi radialis is found on the lateral side or the outside, when this one contracts, we're going to abduct the hand. We're going to pull it up away from the midline of the body. We're going to pull it laterally, which is where it's found. So movements of the hand, flexion and extension, and abduction and adduction. We can also move the forearm doing flexion and extension. So a bicep curl is a good example of when we talked about flexion and extension of the radius and the ulna. So when we're moving the forearm, the, the bicep muscles are pulling on the radius and the ulna to help you do that bicep curl. So that's a great example of, of moving the forearm. Absolutely. Good example of flexion. I know I had um, so so you're talking about with abduction and adduction okay um, what you can use for this so so if you put your arm down next to you and put your your palm facing forward so you're in anatomical position when you um, rotate your thumb closer to your radius there we'll pull up my skeleton he fell down let me pull him up and I can show you with my skeleton Wait for it. Okay. Skeleton friend here in anatomical position. When my skeleton friend, let's see if his joints do this, goes like this, when his thumb comes up toward the radius, this movement is abduction. When he moves his hand back down toward the midline, that's adduction. 
abduction, kind of, I guess waving maybe kind of could be that way. So abduct your hand up and then abduct it back down. So best example, I mean, you can just kind of feel it on, on yourself too. So when you're, you're in anatomical position, and you move your, your hand up, move your hand down. Abduction and adduction. I don't know if there's an, an exercise per se to, to show those things, but that's the best thing I can think of is just doing it yourself. I had a friend who asked me about the humerus. Were there particular humerus bone markings that we wanted to cover really briefly before we call it a day? Okay, um, so we're, we're pointing to something called the intertubercular groove um, and the sulcus. Okay, a few things up there. So. Um, Notice we, we are needing to label stuff on the anterior and the posterior view of the humerus. In your packet, we'll also ask you to do left or right um, sides of the humerus. So be aware that we have to keep track of left versus right. We have to keep track of front versus, versus back. So when we talk about the humerus on the front side of the humerus, this is what the humerus would look like if I stared straight through you when you're in anatomical position. The way you're going to identify that we are looking at the front side of the humerus is uh, by this big area right here. So when I'm looking at the humerus on the front side, notice how I have kind of three indentations here. These are places where the humerus is articulating with the radius and the ulna in the front. When I'm looking at the back side of the humerus, I just see this one line right here. I actually am only articulating with the ulna here in the back. I have this indentation that's called the olecranon fossa. It's a place where the, the humerus indents in for a little hook called the olecranon on the, the ulna to actually attach here. So when you bang your elbow on, on a counter, what you're actually hitting is the ulna bone that, that would be inside here. So I, I'm back here on the front side of, of my humerus here, because that's what we were, we were looking for. Um, the first marking that, that we wanted to point out here was the intertubercular groove. Intertubercular means that I'm in between the tubercles. And I know that tubercle word is, is weird. Does anyone happen to remember what, what a tubercle, what kind of bone marking a tubercle was? Here, I'll, I'll label our, our two tub tubercles for us. Yeah, so it's some kind of bump or projection. On the front side of the humerus, we have two tubercles. We have a bigger one that's called the greater tubercle of the humerus. And then we have a smaller one called the lesser tubercle of the humerus. In between the greater and the lesser tubercle is an indentation called the intertubercular groove or the intertubercular sulcus. So the indentation or the space between the two tubercles that's this thing called the intertubercular groove. Or again, you might see it on a Google search, the intertubercular sulcus, this indentation in between the two tubercles. So that's one of them. Uh, I'll mention the deltoid tuberosity. This tuberosity word was also a projection word. That's this little thing right here, the deltoid tuberosity. A not a trick question. What do we think we find at the deltoid tuberosity? What would be found at the deltoid tuberosity? Yeah, exactly. Um, the deltoid tuberosity is the place where the deltoid muscle attaches. So the bottom part where the deltoid muscle attaches and then it expands all the way up and goes into the shoulder up here. This is the place where the deltoid muscle specifically uh, attaches to the, uh, to the humerus. So deltoid tuberosity right here. 
When we come down here to the distal part of this bone is where we start to get into a, a lot of different bone markings down here. So one of them, let me look at my list here. I know we, what, so I think we asked about the, the capitulum maybe or the troglia. Um, when we're looking at, at our bones here, my pencil on, okay. This first part right here, my medial part, when we're looking at the humerus, this is the trochlea. I'm not going to write the whole thing, but I'll put a couple letters. The trochlea is the middle part. More toward the outside, the bump that's there on the outside, that's the capitulum. The capitulum. So the two things that come together to make, this would be my uh, humeral ulnar joint, it has the trochlea. My humeral radial joint has the capitulum. The capitulum and the trochlea found down here at the bottom. Uh, I think, had we asked about the condyles too? Go ahead, Ariel. So would this be the lateral epicondyle? Correct, yes. Yeah, so the epicondyles are, are a type of bump. Um, so the lateral one on the lateral side of the bone and then my bump over here would be the, this is the medial epicondyle. So up above my trochlea is the, the medial epicondyle. Up above my capitula is the lateral epicondyle. Absolutely. All right. We are even a little over time today. Are there any last quick questions that we want to mention? I'll say too, while we're potentially typing, that I am going to have open office hours tomorrow as well. So if there are particular questions you wanted to address from the lab packet, I will be here tomorrow from 11 to 1 for you to stop by with any of those. <laughs> will there be any curve with the lab? Alas, Jacqueline, there will not. <laughs> no curve. So we got to study like there's no curve, right? Because there will be no curve. But again, it, it's uh, the, the best way to study this is just going to be to practice as much as possible. Um, let me see if Visible Body will be kind to me because I do want to mention that I really feel like for these bone markings that um, Visible Body can be really helpful. Let me drag this, drag this down here, and then I'll share my screen with you. Oops, wrong, wrong place. Remember, when you're in a visible body, I clicked on the humerus here. Remember that there's this little thing right here that says details. When I click on this, it's going to take me to the humerus by itself. And now I can go through and those bone markings we're looking at. So here we go. There's my trochlea that, that we looked at before. Here on the outside, I've got the capitulum. Here's my epi, oops, I can't see if I'm, there's my epicondyle, my lateral one, and my medial epicondyle. Here I have my, I don't know if we made you know the coronoid fossa, but I have that here. If I zoom out, I can rotate it around to get to the back side. So I really think, especially for bone markings, radius, ulna, humerus, uh, visible body is going to be a huge asset to you. So um, please check that out. Let me go back. Let's see if I, there we go. To remind you, so click on a bone and then click on this details thing right here. When you click on the details, it'll show you those bone markings. So please, please practice with that. Um, you've got the visible body assignments too, where it'll, it'll check how much you know. Um, but those that details tab, I think, is going to be really helpful for that. Um, so Ariel asked if we need to know the specific bone markings of the different joints. So here's what I'll tell you about that. Um, I would recommend that you, when you're looking at a skeleton, um, what we mainly want you to be able to do is to name the, the bone markings that are all in one region. So what I mean by that is if, if you looked at a picture of, let me drag this down, of the shoulder right here, I would want you to be able to tell me that the bone markings that live here on the proximal end of the humerus are in the shoulder. 
I would not want you to tell me, we just looked at it, right, how the trochlea and the capitulum are here. I would want you to be make sure that you know that the trochlea and the capitulum are not up here at the shoulder. They're there at the elbow joint, absolutely. They're not up here at the shoulder. Same thing when we when we do stuff on, on the radius and the ulna. Uh, I would want you to know, for example, that the olecranon, which is the little hook at the end of the radius, or at the end of the ulna, excuse me, I would expect you to know that that one's found at the elbow and not down here at the wrist. So I don't think you need to go through and make a list of all of the bone markings in that place, but I do want you to mentally organize in your mind, is this something that's by the elbow or is this something that's by the wrist? Is this something that's by the shoulder or is it something that's by the elbow? So don't waste a lot of time going through and listing the exact bone markings in those places. Focus on the big picture. Is this at the proximal end or the distal end of the bone? That's what we want you to be able to do with it. And yes, to Gloria's question, um, five o'clock today, we're going to start the neuron physiology lecture. Yes. So if you are available and you're not completely anatomied out right after this morning, I will be here at five o'clock. We will start talking about neurons today. So if there are no more particular questions I'm gonna go ahead and stop my recording stick around just a bit for any last minute questions otherwise I hope to see several of you guys tonight at five